Hey, today is April 5th, 2013. We're at the Remington at Valley Ranch in Irving, Texas. With me is uh, Mr. Dale, uh, Martin Dale Messler. He was born February 3rd, 1920. With me, uh, my name is John Hayes with Congressman Kenny Marchant and uh, Matt Jack, who is also on staff of Congressman Kenny Marchant. Mr. Messler was uh, in World War II. He's a Pearl Harbor survivor. He also served in Korea in the United States Navy. His rank was an E-6 Petty Officer. And again, he served uh, in the Pacific and Korea. Well, Mr. Messler, thank you for being with us today. First thing I want to ask you is, how did you get involved in the military? I know you did before Pearl Harbor, but how did you become involved in the military? Well, those days, if you could get a job, 25 cents an hour. And there wasn't any breaks or any uh, extras or anything like there is now. <laughs> you work an hour, you got 25 cents. If you didn't work that hour, you didn't always get it. And if you didn't do it, there was a married man or a family man waiting in line just to take your place in those days. There was, so I figured, well, I'd gone to two uh, summer vacations in school, high school, to CMTC, the Citizen Military Training Corps in uh, Fort Des Moines, Iowa. There you were attached to the Army and you lived in the tents. You had your own uh, Army clothes. You got all your food and everything then, for, you know, through the Army. So I'd done that twice, two uh, vacations in between 11th grade and, 12th, and after 12th. So I didn't like the Army. I went to Navy and liked it. I figured that'd be better and get the, you got your military, your food, your medication, medicals, your clothes, everything furnished and First three months is twenty-one dollars a month, and yeah, that, that was big money those days. And uh, we could uh, go on liberty for a dollar or two and have a good time, have two or three beers and all. Beers were nickel, something like that. So that's I went to Navy that way and. So did you go in the Navy right out of high school? Just about. What year was that? 38. No, no I went 40 then when I joined the Navy. I graduated in 38. And I stayed out by a year, trying you know, two bits an hour here, two bits an hour there, wherever, if you if you can get one. <laughs> what was your basic training like? Huh? Joined, what was your basic training like when you joined the Navy? Well, you did the first three weeks in isolation. So in case any the new kids had a, any disease or something, they'd compute. And then you went to what they called the, uh, cross the aisle. You started your training, really training and all. It was about, uh, uh, three weeks of our my training was 24, about 20 below zero in Chicago, right on the lake. And uh, so when we we had to learn to take a guard duty, so we walked around the lake, a lagoon there, took us one hour, used a battle lantern, by the time we got back to there, the dry cell batteries in it was froze. The light was out. So I had to go back in, set the battery lantern on the register. The next guy went out for an hour. And we did that for four hours. Then it's 
you practice the marching and all that on the ice and sleep, which was fun. <laughs> but uh, then you got our basic life. I went right to, in April, I went to uh, Pennsylvania in Long Beach and uh, stayed there about two weeks. Then uh, we ordered the fleet to Honolulu. Well, what was your job in the Navy? What did you train for out of basic order? Where did you go for well, school? Well, at your first six months for Navy then, you were deck force. You scrubbed the decks and all that. But then after that, then you could go, and I went to gunnery. And uh, so I took a gunner's mate, and I went to, uh, we just did that, and so, oh, uh, anyway, you. Yeah. Well, were there some interesting uh, people that you were so, uh, in basic training or in your uh, gunnery training, uh, people that stand out now to you? No, not, not that I remember. There may have been some, I don't know. But anyway, we stayed there and along in uh, up the beach. In Long Beach? Yeah, and about a week and a half, two weeks, and the ship went all of the whole fleet. Okay, what uh, ship were you on? Battleship Pennsylvania. That's where you boarded the Pennsylvania. Yeah. And. Uh, well, what were you assigned as a gunner's mate? What were you assigned to on the Pennsylvania? What time? Well, we were on two or three uh, as a striker, and uh, you just worked in turrets and learned how to how to work them and how to work in them and all. So, I didn't uh, have a small arms. I went to the Stuarts, where we 14 inch. And, uh, so we just do that. And so, when. Uh, well, how was the uh, voyage over to Honolulu? Huh? How was your voyage to Honolulu? Your first experience on the Pennsylvania? What were some of your thoughts about that? Well, it was, uh, the battleship is just about like a city. There's 15, 1,800 people. Wartime is 2,000, 2,200. And uh, you've got everything aboard that you have in every town. Uh, cleaners and all this and that. And the uh, little candy store where you get your tobacco and candy and ice cream and all that. You have those little stores there. So they're open uh, from four o'clock on, they're open. And uh, so you do your laundry every day. You, they issue you a bucket you put your name in brass, riveted on it, and you shine it up, and you keep it shined every day. And when at four o'clock, when your work was done, you started for the shower, you took a towel with you and your soap and all, and your bucket and your clothes what you had on. So when you get in the shower, you wash everything yourself, the live steam. And when you, you turn the live steam on and that bucket's boiling within a couple of, about a minute, and uh, you scrub your clothes, then you go out on the deck, and they lower the clothesline, you hang it up, and at a certain time, and they may pull it way up, so nobody can touch it, and until it dries, 
And then a uh, certain time they call you, or you know, like 6.30, say, yes, say 6.30, that uh, your clothes are dry. So you you go up on the quarter deck or forecastle, whatever, and take them off the line, fold them up, put them back in your closet, in your, uh, uh, your little locker. That was a food. Was it good? Was it good food? Huh? Was your food very good? Oh yeah. You ate uh, family style. There was ten men to a table, and each mess cook had two tables. And you had your plates, your cups, your saucers, and all that. You didn't have any trays or any of that then. And the mess captain, who was the head of the table, he was usually first class petty officer. And nobody would eat or anything until he said so. Then they started passing the food around. And when the dog got around, he said, you can eat. So you started eating. And uh, you didn't get up when you were done. You just sat there until everybody's done. And he gives you the order, okay, get him, you're on. So we, uh, now all ships I don't think were that way, but the battleship was, and Pennsylvania was anyway, and so. But anyway, you, Mr. Captain, you didn't do nothing except what he said during meals. And well, how long did it take you to uh, get from Long Beach to Pearl Harbor? Five days. Yeah, those days. It, what year it, was this that you? Uh, uh, in forty. In forty. Forty-one. No, forty. You, well, forty and forty-one. Yeah. But you first you arrived in Pearl Harbor in 1940. Yeah. Okay. What was your experiences? Uh, what did you feel like when you saw Pearl coming up? Well, just just an island. You knew you'd heard about it. You didn't know what it was. And then Honolulu was just a small town. Of course, we went to Maui on uh, Lahaina Roads first. That was our staging place because we couldn't take the whole fleet in Honolulu at once because it run them out of food with all of our sailors going ashore that run them out of food, out of milk and everything else. So they had, the government had started flying milk and food in there every day and so the battleships would go in for two weeks. Then they'd pull out to Maui. And maybe the cruisers or the destroyers go in for two weeks. And they'd pull out and one of the others would come in. So you rotate like that. And they kept flying food and everything in. And pretty soon they supply ships but carrying a lot more and because the planes weren't big too big in those days and uh, they would supply more and all so got so we could go in but we still could not go all of it at one time we uh, would be battleships or cruisers or destroyers or and uh, so because it, it was still wasn't that big of a city. And uh, tell me a little bit about the Pennsylvania. And uh, it was in dry dock. Uh, yeah. When did it go into dry dock? And what well, were the reasons for uh, that? We had to do I don't know scrape the bottom and all. We had, had to do that ever so often to get the barnacles off and paint paint the bottom with what to call red lead 
And so we were in there for that. And they'd taken the four screws of the propellers off and cleaned them up because they're brass. And they, when did you go in to dry dock? How far ahead of December 7th? Oh, it was just uh, where our, we were flagship Pacific Fleet. Nimitz was aboard. And uh, so we were only just uh, 50 yards from the dry dock we went in, number one. And uh, the casting and the downs went ahead of us. Uh, they were destroyers, DEs. They were on each side, and our bow went in between them, and we were all on our blocks. Well, when, when uh, for some reason, they did not get our third, our fourth screw back on Saturday night, where we could move over to 1010, where we were supposed to be. And the Ogallala was the oldest uh, mine layer in the fleet at that time, the wooden fleet. And it took our place. Well, it was the first one torpedoed because they, that's where we were supposed to be. And we were flagship. We were sister ships to the Arizona, and Oklahoma and Nevada. You couldn't hardly tell any of them, either, which was which on the outside. So then we uh, went in there and the, we did not, we stayed in the dry dock. And it was, happened to be the first time in the history that the battleship fired as the enemy without a drop of water around it. That's uh, something different, and because we fired any aircraft, but uh, you couldn't fire a broadside or a man. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, that early morning, December seventh, uh, when you well, got up and just uh, let's go. Yeah, I go. had I was on duty. I had the four to eight watch. And I just finished breakfast, went out on the quarter deck, and sat down on one of the bits, lit my pipe, and we started smoking. And we knew the carriers were coming in, and each carrier had a wide strip around the fuselage of different colors. So one came in. First one was red. Well, we just saw that from a distance. It's a meatball, but from a distance it looked like a strip. And the uh, so we watched, and the first divers came in Ford Island, and they always made dummy runs with water bombs and all. And he made his runs, but they exploded. Oh, uh, something's wrong somewhere. He's going to get in trouble. Well, then they came by us to hit the Ogallala the torpedo plane. And uh, so then we saw it wasn't our plane. <laughs> it was, and uh, they got uh, so then they passed word, you know, general quarters, main stations. They got all the anti-aircraft guns going. And all of that started firing. And they uh, went to a, then the second raid. They left that one raid, first one. And uh, well, one of our our gun, gun boss, uh, lieutenant commander, he had been married about a week and a half. And his wife and three other officers and wives were out on the golf course. 
And all of the all the planes came in strafing. They just cut them in half. And uh, he went in uh, Section Eight for about three years. I heard he finally got okay to get out. And, but uh, a lot of them were like that, and the. Uh, we were bombed and we hit three direct hits and a couple of near, near misses in the Penn City. We, oh, we lost, uh, I think it was 24 men ourselves because we didn't, we didn't, uh, they missed us, you know, because we were, weren't where we were supposed to be. So they got to Arizona. Uh, they couldn't tell the difference. And uh, that's where they got it. And then the Oki and the uh, Maryland uh, was uh, also. So we were still, they were on Battleship Row. We were all left. I think it was 10 of them. Way Battleships in a row there, but we were over there still in dry dock, and uh, so we flooded the dry dock as quick as possible. Because uh, if a torpedo or a caisson, that force of that water would have probably pushed us clear up to the hospital, because casting it down in front of them. And the bow had just gone run right, right over. But uh, they didn't get it torpedoed. So we flooded it and got out. We had to throw some of uh, our ammunition was old in the water so we could get rid of it and get a hang fire while you didn't wait 10, 15 minutes. You, we had about 10 seconds, if it didn't fire them in, take it out and drop it in a drink, so. So you were manning your turret during this time? Huh? You were manning your turret at this time? Yeah. Did but you on anything? the second round, second uh, raid, a three inch 50 gun crew right below us, part of them were wiped out or the gun was wiped out. So they took us, me, because I was the gunner's mate, third, third class, and a couple of strikers, and replaced the ones that were killed and injured on that three inch, and we fired it in the second raid. But you never know whether you hit anything or not because so much flack was up there in the air you didn't, you didn't know where yours went. But uh, sometimes you could see on the five inch, you could see where we go, but not on the three. And uh, so we just did what we could. And, and the next day or that what day. Were, what were your day, impressions uh, as you were looking over Pearl Harbor and those ships on battlefield. Well, it was a mess. What were you thinking? What was your impression? Well, the Oklahoma was turned over, the Arizona was sunk, the, uh, I don't know, one of the other wagons were down, California was all right, uh, down. Did you see the Nevada going out? Yeah, the Maryland, it tried to start to get out the channel. And then they told me, get back there. So they just beached it. Because if he'd gotten a channel, nobody got out. And uh, so soon the, the raids were over, the 50 foot motor launches started around the grapnels, pulling the dead and the injured out of oily water. Most of us on fire from the oil. And 
to try and swim in the in the fire, and then they get in their lungs and all. And did you get wounded in the uh, uh, assault? Huh? Did you get wounded at this time? No, you didn't have time yet. No, were you wounded? I know you had the Purple Heart. Did you? Were you wounded at this point? Oh, I was the, the first, or yeah, the second road got my fingers off. That's all of mine. <laughs> Not much compared to most of them, but uh, that. Then after it's over, we kept everybody trying to get straightened out and clean up the ships and all, and get the bodies out and everything. And, uh, me and a couple of three others. For going around picking up parts, and throw them in this uh, stretcher, take them down to sick bay where they had a job of trying to match them up. But uh, we didn't do that. We just took it down, and uh, that was uh, about it. The next day or two, they kept. Reg and, uh, and uh, bodies and all, and got a lot of them. And then, uh, oh, a little bit before New Year's, we uh, escorted two other ships that was damaged more than we were. We went to Bremerton. They went to Bremerton. We went part way beyond New Frisco, and we turned back and went to Hunter's Point, in Frisco, and uh, we stayed there. The ship stayed there. Uh, I'd put in for a gunnery school, new uh, five-inch gunnery, and so I went down to San Diego to school for. I think it's eight weeks, seven or eight weeks. And I came back and I was bored about a week and a half, two weeks. And they sent me to Washington, D.C. for school. And uh, no, that was just for new construction. They got on our cruiser at uh, Philadelphia. And I was on the Columbia. I stayed on there a little over two years. Came back from the South Pacific, which was, uh, where we went, we were at the Solomon Islands, which is Canal, to the civilians. They know where that is, but they don't know Solomon Islands. And uh, so we, and what ship were you on when you went to Solomon's? Columbia, USS Columbia, Columbia light cruiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed there a little over two years. And that's where we had our nine major battles and I don't know how many smaller ones. And the, uh, the major battle was when the Cruiser or a wagon was sunk, or a battleship was sunk, or uh, set on fire or something and took off. So, if it just no ships were sunk or anything, why well, it wasn't, a, I don't guess, considered a major, as far as I know. <laughs> but, uh, you anyway. want to tell a little bit about some of these major battles? Huh? Tell a little bit about your experiences in these major battles. Well, being in the tour, you don't know. You don't see or hear. You hear it, but that's it. So you don't really know. But uh, you just keep your firing your main batteries there, like a 14 inch, is accurate up to about 20 miles. Uh, 16 inch is 22, 23 miles. So 
you just uh, sometimes you don't even see your opponents because they're too far off, but they're fired too. <laughs> so, but uh, we were pretty well accurate about 20 miles away. Horizon is seven miles, so you got uh, give you an idea. At 13 miles, you can't see. <laughs> no. You say you were in uh, nine major battles. Uh, what major battles were these? Huh? Yeah, you were in nine major battles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which ones? Empress Augusta Bay was the biggest one. That's uh, right before we secured the whole islands. Uh, that was two and a half about two and a half hours and I carried I was tour captain then I carried 960 rounds of ammunition and when that was over I had nine rounds left and the other tourists were had troubles so they started sending me their ammunition but I didn't need it right to last, and so that's, that's about it. Now, names of the others is on the islands. I don't know, I don't remember any of the island. Uh, I know Kulabangara and Reno and all that, but which battles, which I don't know anymore. That's a long time ago. <laughs> uh, well, what'd you do after this? Huh? After the battles, what'd you do then on the Columbia? After the battle? After this period on the Columbia. Where'd you go then? Oh, I came back to... Then I went to 12 weeks of gunnery in uh, big tour, bigger turrets and missiles and all that in D.C. for 12 weeks. I got, I had delayed action, orders going home. Going, I got married then in 44 and she had never been to Harley over to Kansas City and back. And we got on the train, went to D.C. and I'd been there before but not long. But anyway, we uh, went over there and we got whatever we could and then I went to uh, USS Amsterdam in a light cruiser and it went back up to like the Philippines and uh, up in Japan and we were uh, ran patrol on the east side of Japan. What year was this? 44, before the war started, 45. And uh, <clears throat> then we, we went, the, the uh, channels took it. The channel up to Tokyo is about 30 miles. So we had ships ever so often, all the gun, uh, any aircraft guns are manned in case some of the diehards, because a lot of them didn't like to want the enemy in emperor to concede. They wanted to fight to the death, but they he wouldn't do it after the A-bombs. And uh, so far as I know, none of us had a fire or anything. And we stayed that day and then we had to, everything was worked all right in our ships anyway, on our bunch. And, uh, we went ashore the next day for 30, we had about six hours 
Liberty or in one of the t little towns, little villages. And uh, you could see some of the main batteries they had back in the caves. They, they could roll out and do the, uh, you know, but they didn't need them because it wasn't there. But we could see them. So, after that, well, it was signed. And Where were you when they signed the treaty? It was up, oh, about eight miles up in the channel. And uh, I, don't, I can't remember the exact little town. But, uh, Could you see the Missouri? Huh? Could you see the Missouri as they were? Oh, no. No, we were a long ways from Tokyo. We were closer to the mouth of the channel. We were probably two or three miles up, so... Uh, so but the ships were on up there. We, we just didn't. Well, we're off, uh, we're off Japan now, and uh, I guess you're on the Amsterdam, is that right? On the Amsterdam, okay, then, yeah, just keep, uh, what's then your experience after the war, why well, then we went to uh, 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 I went to me Agawam, which was a baby tanker. Somehow, some yeoman up on the hill said GM instead of BM. Uh, he wrote BM, instead of, which is mate, boat's mate, instead of dinner's mate. So they transferred me as a boatswain. And I didn't know very little. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we went to, uh, on that, we carried JP fuel, av gas, stuff like that, to all the islands. When the planes could get there, then they could fly on in to Korea or Nam, Vietnam. So that's all we did then. We just we'd unload our, our tanks come back to Honolulu, fill them up, and wait maybe a day or two, and go back out to another island, take all their fuel out there for them. And uh, we did that for quite a few months. What year was this, or years? Well, that was uh, during the Vietnam era, and, uh, and I got, I was still in, I was in reserve and all, but uh, then I came back out and I was here in Dallas and I was teaching the kids a little bit about gunnery before they went over to Vietnam. And, uh, then I talked to them when they came back 18 months later to get some of their experiences and all. So that's about what I did. Then uh, after that, uh, we'd moved to Irving here and uh, my wife worked uh, the uh, newspaper and she called me, said, post office, but I got an ad running the next issue for help. So I said, oh, so I went on down to the post office and got on. He said, how do you know that? This don't come out for about four days. I told him, said, well, my wife's printed it up. Said, oh. <laughs> But he was ex-Navy also, so he was the mailman in the mail. So we just then went to uh, 
Pearl Harbor survivor. Uh, group. Tell me a little bit about the Pearl Harbor survivor group. How'd you get involved? And well, was it, like? it, it was just for Pearl Harbor deal. And here in uh, Dallas, or Irving, we, the original one started, there was about 12 of us. And uh, we met, and we lasted maybe a year, year and a half, and it just died, died out. And a couple of years later, it started again. But then it lasted until just, uh, well, I was about a year and a half ago, two years. They said 60 years was getting too much. No, nobody could come to reunions, hardly anybody anyway. So they just canceled everything. So there's no more Pearl Harbor survivor units. We still get the magazine once in a while. It said it's keeping it up. I don't know. I haven't read it, received any. But uh, that was all that we knew then. So let me ask you: What did you think? What were your impressions uh, at the end of World War II when they signed the treaty? What were your feelings? Glad it was over. <laughs> but. Uh, Oh, I don't know. We, they're just, they're just glad it was over and didn't have anybody going or coming anymore. And in '46 in Hannibal, Missouri, they started shipping the bodies back. We had a hundred in one year. We had a hundred different bodies coming in on the train. And I was a reserve there, so we had to go and take them to the nearby cities, you know, to, for their burial, and family and everything. So we were pretty busy then for that year. And uh, I don't know so, what else. Uh, any uh, any memorable or unusual experiences uh, that you'd like to add while you were in the military that stand out, other than Fort Harbor, of course? The what? Any unusual experiences or memorable experiences? I know Pearl Harbor, but anything additional? No, I don't. Pearl was about the biggest experience. Uh, experience. But, uh, How long did you spend in the Navy total? Total? Well, let's see. The reserve and everything was 34 years. And uh, after Korea, I got out and joined the reserve. So, whatever, the World War II, I've been in out there 19 months when it started, so from 40 to, what, Korea is what, 53 when it went out, something like that, I don't know exactly. So I had 10, 12 active years or more, a little more, and then uh, went to reserve, so. What ship did you serve on in the Korean era? Agawam. Agawam. And you were off the, the little coast tanker. A little tanker. Yeah. Yeah, that was a baby tanker. It wasn't a great huge one. It was 60,000 barrels and all. We carried about 16 barrels in our tanks and all. So just, but we had enough for the islands and it would last maybe two or three weeks, we'd be back again. Have you been back to Pearl Harbor? Uh, not since 52. We, we lived out there in uh, 
52 and I had the family there for six, seven months. I had two daughters and wife. I lived on Waikiki and Kapilani. They're at crossroads of the Pacific. Uh, that was a main thing in there's a hamburger joint there, but the Crossroads Pacific, and they had signs from everywhere in the world from there. And uh, we had an apartment right in back of them. Um, oh. Did it bring back memories uh, when you were living out there? Huh? Uh, did it bring back memories of December 7th when you were out there? No, not particularly because we didn't. We weren't in. Uh, my wife wasn't in, in in there at all, and uh, so I'd go back to a ship and all. But yeah, you you looked at it, you know as a battleship rose, you went in or I come out. Of course, now I wouldn't want to go in. And it's changed so much, I probably wouldn't even know where I was. And uh, you can't go around Fort Island anymore because they built a bridge in there. At, uh, before, while you came in, you went around Fort Island, and there's a battleship row here, 1010 Doctor here. That was it. But, We saw the USS Shaw, it was in a floating dry dock, I mean, yeah, floating, and the bomb hit it, blew the, everything forward of a bridge off, a whole bow and everything. And after, after the, uh, kind of calmed down, here comes a Shaw backwards. Back and down, clear over another berth on down in father, and uh, no bow at all, cause it was gone. But uh, no, we picked a, we picked up a, quite a few bodies for a few days out of the water with grapnels and all, and from a launches and we got our bow looked like a sieve because the casting and the downs was hit direct and knocked them over to off the block so they fused together and all their shrapnel or other thing punched holes in our bow so then now Yard had to patch all those holes up so we could get underway, and we got in Frisco New Year's Eve, and uh, we'd escorted the other two ships uh, up to Bremerton, and then so on the way up we. Uh, you know, it was getting pretty rough, the water and cold. And uh, we saw torpedoes coming. They were, weren't supposed to be anymore, but they said there were two torpedoes coming. Well, we were on a high on the, on the uh, wave and so it went under us. But uh, the, the first night torpedo attack was in right off Guadalcanal. At, uh, we did the same thing, but we were high and it went under us and hit the Chicago over there and sunk it. And didn't sink it right immediately, but we stayed with it until the tugs come out from to tow it in 
When we left, it wasn't long ago. We heard the dive bombers, they finished Doug in the Chicago. So, and it is, I don't know. Well, you're, uh, let's talk about your military ex experience and uh, how did that influence your thinking about uh, war and the military in general? Um, By to... serving in the military, how did that uh, uh, affect your thinking about war and the military in general? Well, you've got to have it, and it's not your choosing, but and you may, from North Korea right now, you may have another one. He's moving your t missiles all down on the coast, so you may have another one for most any time. How do you think military service affected your life? And your thinking? Well, for the best, I think. And uh, I've never regretted any of it. And I've, I've been glad of it all the time. It's military uh, more or less got all of our, our two daughters through school and everything and so I guess, you know, I don't know how you'd say it, but it, uh, I've never regretted it, and I think it did a lot of good uh, for me and for my daughter. Uh, my wife died Monday. She passed away Monday, and 68 years marriage, and so we had a good marriage and everything. So. And all because of the military. <laughs> well, any other final comments that you have about your military service? No, I just, I think a lot of these kids be, be well off if they went to the military and help them get squared away, find out what's going on really, and Taking orders and you gotta take them and you gotta do what they say. A lot of them today don't know nothing. And uh, today I had one of the medic uh, she comes twice a week or every week on Friday to check my pills and everything. And she said, oh, you're a survivor. She said, is that something special? And she doesn't even know what Pearl Harbor is. And there's some grown-ups don't know. And you ask them when it was, you know, 38, 50, they don't know that date. So that's the reason I think these interviews do a lot of good for the old younger kids. My great grandchildren, two of them, man, boy and girl, I doubt if they know too much about it. My granddaughters probably don't know too much about it. She knows a little more because she's uh, been getting along with it. And, you know, you know, I think a lot of them will, should know a lot more about it than they do. And, uh, well, everybody should really. And, uh, there's a lot of these especially the uh, Mexicans and the blacks and all the young blacks. They don't know one of them from the other. 
And then once in a while you'll get a smart one that knows all that, but very seldom. Well, Mr. Messler, thank you for talking with us today about your military experiences. Yeah. On behalf of Congressman Marchant and the United States government, we'd like to thank you for your yeah. service. Yeah. You were part of the greatest generation, and we appreciate what you did. Thanks yeah. for talking with us. Not many of us left. <laughs>